Greetings, friends. If by slavery we mean one human owning other humans, then slavery is a timeless phenomenon. In the ancient world of the Greeks and the Romans, most people would have been slaves. In Africa, for time immemorial, slavery has existed. Not the plantation kind, which was arguably a lot more harsh, but certainly slaves existed in Africa as prestige, symbols of status for the local chiefs. Africa being uh, always a collection of tribal kingdoms, often warring on each other. And one of the principal spoils from the enemy was to take sl slaves from their tribe. And even in recent centuries for the Europeans, the possibility of being enslaved was very real, if not likely for the common person, certainly in the expanding seafaring age of the 17th century. We know that Englishmen were very aware of the possibility of being captured by North Africans in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean uh, region and being enslaved for life. Maybe they, your family could purchase you back. It might happen, but very unlikely. And there was this, the song, Rule Britannia, which, if I'm not mistaken, comes from the 17th century. If, if you know more in the comments, you can correct me. But And one of the main lines of the song is, Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. Britons never, ever, ever shall be slaves. Because they could be slaves from the, the Berbers or, you know, the people who were the Moors in, in Spain, you know, they'd been pushed back to what is now Morocco, that part of the world. And, of course, you can think of the Slavic peoples, the Slavs. There is obviously a relation in the word Slav to slave. At some point in their history, the Slavs traced their ancestors to people who were enslaved. Slavery existed in practically all major civilizations. It was a worldwide business, and the Europeans got into the game fairly late. The Arabs preceded the Europeans in the slave trade by hundreds and hundreds of years. They'd been getting uh, many of their slaves from East Africa, but also from further afield. And the Arabs, of course, took their African slaves to the Persian Gulf, and they castrated the males. So they cut off the testicles so that the slaves could not reproduce. Arabs were very cold and cruel to do that, but also very calculating and you can argue smart because they didn't want an African population expanding in their own backyard. It's, it was okay for Arabs to inseminate East African women, Bantu speaking women, and you see this in you see the mixed race peoples today in East Africa and places like Zanzibar. But the Arabs didn't want that happening in their own home turf. Now, the, the whites and the Europeans specifically, they, they uh, had moral qualms about slavery, of course, with Christian ideals. It sort of tends to, to dissuade you from getting into that, but, you know, you can make a lot of money in it. And let's be honest, there were a lot of Jews in this slave trade. I don't know about specifically Arabs in the Western slave trade, but it, they weren't all Europeans. Uh, there was a bit of mix in who the, who the actual slave traders were. Let's remember that at this time, I'm, I'm talking, you know, before the 19th century uh, or even before the, the, the Civil War, but specifically we, the 18th century and before that, this is a time where if you're not a slave, even if you're a white, you may live a life very similar to what you would expect a slave to live because of all, most of the people coming into the Americas, they didn't have any money. They were indentured laborers and you would be in, in that means you would be bound to a contract usually for seven or eight years and then half of them would die during that time. Uh, so in being an indentured laborer, you're kind of like a slave anyways as a white. Or if imagine all the sailors in the age of the high seas in the British Empire. They needed tons of manpower to run those sail ships. And you're basically a slave. I mean, you would likely die on the job. You would you'd be malnourished. They had to press people uh, to fill the ships. Sure, maybe not all of them were so miserable. But generally, the indentured laborers, 
the sailors, they would be pretty miserable. And then another kind of uh, slave, you wouldn't say specifically slave, would be the serfs. Now, I know when I say serfs, I'm pushing the clock back a bit into more of the medieval time period. Um, but, you know, that was sort of uh, still, th that sort of medieval uh, feudalistic uh, way of life didn't disappear overnight. It, you know, it, it was phased out over time. And serfs were bound to specific land. However, the serfs are, are a bit different from the indentured laborers in America and the sailors because a lot of the serfs were actually happy to be serfs. They weren't so miserable because in those chaotic days, especially of the earlier uh, Middle Ages, in, in such a chaotic world, you kind of wanted a lord as your protector to, so that you won't just get pillaged and destroyed by some other warring lord. If he was benevolent, then things were all right. Most of the slaves for America were obtained from West Africa because it was closer. Now, as I mentioned, the Africans were already enslaving each other, so it was easy for the slave traders to make deals with them. But the Europeans had to stay in their coastal forts. They could not venture into the interior. They were not able to do anything like that until later on, much later on in the 19th century, when they had quinine and other medicines to protect them from disease and also bolt-action rifles. But before that, it was a land that would kill you very, very quickly from tropical disease, malaria, yellow fever, dysentery, which is different. Not, that's not a virus, but you know, that comes from poor sanitation. This dysentery can happen, you know. You know, being a soldier back then, you would, you'd die very likely even in a temperate climate. But, but it's just going to be all that much worse in the tropical parts of the world in the Caribbean, in West Africa, in India too, to an extent. This is just uh, something I'm drawing on my memory here, but it's very likely uh, a statistic, because you get these military statistics, because the military ob obviously, they kept more statistics than the general uh, population or government would. So you can look at a garrison of, let's say 1,500 soldiers is transported to let's say the Gold Coast, which is today Ghana. So you would be stationed there for a, a num probably a number of years. It wasn't like being, if you're a British soldier back then, it's similar to being a sailor. I mean, you're, you're in it for the long haul. A lot of them were, were basically uh, for life because they were from a very low social status they were joining the army basically because they had no other options. You're basically signing your life away. So anyways, you're, you're there for a long time. So the first year goes by of those 1500 men, half of them might be dead. Now, it might not always have happened like that, but very often half of them would be dead from disease or even more than half from tropical disease, from overexertion in the heat and it didn't help that they drank too much and they, they were forced to live in dirty barracks. So there were other factors there, but primarily it's the tropical environment that is a death sentence. So then the second year goes by, another quarter of them are dead. You, you, you end up after the third year with a core, maybe a few hundred of men, and they've survived their seasoning. And they're, 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 a bit, they're better candidates to last another five to ten years. Probably, they're probably, you know, most of them wouldn't last even another ten years. But still, you'll get those ones who have adapted. They just happen to have the immunity, something about their constitution. They're, you always get these men, like in the Belgian Congo, some men just wouldn't die. And then everyone else at the, at the trading station dies within a year. And then just, I don't know, it's a very funny thing how it happens. But I'm telling you this to explain to you that Europeans were in absolutely no position to take slaves by force. They did not raid African villages. They relied on the Africans to do that. Maybe the Arabs did that too. I'm not sure it gets a bit more fuzzier there because the Arabs, their trading caravans spread all through the Sahara, so they could have been getting into the business as well. But basically, 
Um, you, I mean, by the time the Europeans were physically able to take slaves if they wanted to, they had the British Empire had long ago abolished slavery, and and uh, the United States had all, already emancipated the slaves uh, from the Civil War. By the time the technological capacity to actually forcefully take the slaves had developed, so if the Europeans got their slaves from the African slave traders, from the warlords, from the chiefs, what did they give in return? Well, mostly guns and alcohol, and other manufactured goods. But just like with the Native Americans, guns and alcohol were the most important. For the Native Americans, they also liked knives and, and pots and pans. But with Africa, they might have already had some knives because Africa was a bit more technologically advanced than the Native Americans because they, had, they were pastoralists, they had herds, they had uh, some bronze weapons, they had more military organization. So... Uh, that was the other, by the way, that was the other reason, uh, not just the tropical diseases, it was the real uh, ability of the warlords to organize and, uh, you know, kill Europeans who advanced into the interior. Though Those were the two main reasons. Now, this presence of the European or, or Jewish or whatever slave traders, it, it did probably increase the incentive to make war within Africa to get more slaves, to get more guns and alcohol to get your warriors drunk and give them the weapons to keep continuing the job. Uh, so that it, yeah, it probably intensified, but we know that slavery was already an established uh, custom. And I would add that it, th this continuation of these slave wars would have happened, as mentioned, because of this division of Africa into tiny tribal kingdoms, which without European colonization today, it would be the same. Okay, Ghana would not exist. There would be the Ashantis, the Aways, the Ga, the people in the north, whatever. They would have their own kingdoms. Sometimes they would get along. Sometimes they would fight each other. But the technology would be the same as it was in the 17th century before they even had contact with the Europeans. I'm not trying to be condescending there. Most cultures in the world don't have this progress thing. This, this progress, this technological, it's mostly or really only in a European invention. Yes, the Chinese were very advanced, uh, uh, 500 to 700 years relatively to Europeans, but, but with them, everything's circular. Everything is circular and coming back, and they'll make water clocks, but they won't make mechanical clocks. Now, there's another important reason here why there were so many slaves available in, in Africa, not just because they could just exploit the local divisions, but because the Europeans had introduced maize to the Africans, otherwise known as corn. But back then, corn just meant grain. So somehow maize got to mean corn, or corn came to mean maize. But maize and other crops too, but the, the big one is maize. Maybe uh, certain tubers, I don't know. But uh, I'm not sure about sweet potato, or but... Uh, Basically, maize is an ex extremely productive crop, and it allowed the Af because the Africans are already producing, you know, practicing agriculture, and they're able to now produce their uh, increase their caloric production enormously, and that increased their population. So there's more Africans available. There's excessive population there, and and so more stock for slave traders. Now, when I say Europeans introduced uh, maize, uh, it wasn't like a direct policy, but at some point from the opening of the Americas, because maize came from Mexico or somewhere in that part of the world, you know, this has gone around. This is the Colombian exchange, as it may be called. Some West Africans uh, told me that cocoa has always been growing in in West Africa. Like, no, it hasn't. Cocoa came from the Aztec Empire. The Spanish brought it back to Europe, but then someone brought it from there to West Africa, probably fairly recently. There were two main factors driving the colonization of the eastern seaboard of North America, making money and religious persecution. The south was where you could make money more easily, more readily. The north was where you had to put in a lot of hard work. And funny enough, over time, the north came to make way more money than the south did. That's why it won the Civil War. But at the time, the south was the place for cash crops because it had a, a semi-tropical or fully, tr fully tropical climate. You could produce cotton, rice, rice. 
and the biggest cash crop of the whole 18th century, sugarcane. Although I don't know how much sugarcane could actually be grown in the American South, but especially in the Caribbean islands, keeping in mind that before the American Revolution, this was all part of the British Empire. So Jamaica and uh, was the primary British producer for sugarcane, and uh, Haiti, or whatever it used to be called, was one of the primary producers for France. And let's keep in mind an important reality, which is that during the days of the Atlantic slave trade, what became the United States? It received a fairly small share of all of these uh, West African slaves. Most of them went to Brazil. And if you look at CIA statistics, 43% roughly of Brazil's population today is of mixed white and black uh, origin. They say it only 7% of purely black. So you have to question a bit if, it, I mean, uh, I've heard, I've heard other, you know, people saying that Brazil is basically 50% African, but, you know, so take those statistics uh, kind of with a grain of salt there, but it shows you, I mean, it's a significantly different picture in the United States. What is it, 10% or 15% of the population now is of African origin? It's not just Brazil, Caribbean in, in general. Um, there were slaves brought to Colombia... Peru, not in quite such large numbers. I think it a lot of it has to do with geography. A lot of it has to do with the fact that there were large Native American populations already established there that were so numerous that were in some sense very different from what the Europeans encountered in North America, like in the, like the, the remnants of the Inca Empire. Of course, they were enslaved too by the Spanish, not so much for plantation work, but to work in the mines. The South had the plantation economy, it had cash crops, but raising these crops, as much money as it will produce, it requires a huge amount of human labor. The only industrial technology of available before the 19th century on a sugar plantation would have been the crushing wheel, or whatever you call it, that you know crushes the cane. And even that had to be powered by human or animal power. And as I already discussed from military statistics, we know that whites don't do well in tropical climates, not at least not in that period of history, and especially if they have to work out in the sun in the fields and they would get fevers because initially they didn't bring in African slaves. Initially, they used indentured laborers. They, they used white workers, but they just tended to die. They just wouldn't survive long enough and you'd be losing money. They made a gamble, which was a mistake for the future of America. They decided to start bringing over Africans as slaves. And they did that because obviously the Africans are more advanced physically for this sort of situation, for this environment. So forget what you've been taught in school. The races are biologically different. And the African man is superior to the white man in terms of endurance and strength. So in other words, he's much less likely to die from malaria and yellow fever. He also has better eyesight. There's all sorts of other biological differences. George Washington owned about 100 slaves and his wife Martha owned over 200 slaves at their estate in Mount Vernon, Virginia. Washington expected his slaves to give 100% and he made sure they were working hard. He did pursue fugitive slaves. At the same time, he seems to have known some of them fairly well, if not as friends, then as lifelong acquaintances. We see this when he went on his surveying trip in the 1780s into the wilderness of Virginia. At times, for several days, he was accompanied by only uh, two slaves or maybe three slaves if they really hated him, they could have killed him in his sleep. Now, I'm assuming Washington probably thought most uh, blacks were of a lower order. That was just the, you know, the views of the times. Uh, however, this information should show us that despite his aristocratic views, I mean, he was aloof to the people on the frontier. They didn't really like him and he looked down on them. But despite all of that, uh, whites, at least at, at that time, and, and I believe today, are capable of seeing nuance. Washington, as this aristocrat, could be around 
these common slaves without necessarily being an asshole, being a snob, like an Indian Brahmin who is disgusted at the mere presence of an untouchable caste, like even if their shadow, uh, if an Indian Brahmin is touched by the shadow of an untouchable, he has to bathe himself. But anyways, I don't think that's the case in colonial America, at least not, not so extremely, because the plantation owners were necessarily going to be around blacks and have a certain understanding of them that northerners would never achieve. And if Washington, you know, he may not have seen himself as an equal or a friend, but he was willing to trust them, obviously, trust those certain slaves that he, that he judged of good character. Maybe I'm postulating a bit too far on this, but I think an aristocrat can maintain a reposed, paternal, maybe even benevolent attitude in the presence of people of a lower social status. And there's so much censorship with uh, YouTube these days. The queen bee tries to keep the drones in line. Think nothing wrong, speak nothing wrong, censorship, racism, racism. By the way, do you know the origin of the word racism? It was created by Soviet intellectuals in the 1920s, primarily by Leon Trotsky. It was a device to tarnish or demonize Slavs. There's that word again, like Ukrainian Slavs, other Slavs. And uh, basically to shame them because they did not see themselves as equal to all the other peoples or races. Get in line. You're part of the Soviet uh, Union. Well, I don't know if it was quite the Soviet Union. At, well, I guess it was. But, you know, it expanded after World War II. But basically, like, all the socialist republics, they had to be on the same page. You see where this, the birth, the seed of this idea of racism comes from the Soviets. So every time you're using the word racism or calling someone a racist, Leon Trotsky and his Soviet brethren would be proud of you. Slavery may indeed be immoral, but that's not really the point. Now, I'm not going to say that some people deserve to be enslaved because only God can judge your soul. But if you study enough history, you get wise enough to refrain from making idealistic statements such as, we all deserve to be completely free. The point about why American slavery was a mistake was that it involved bringing a large population of Africans into the midst of the white colonies, and then the African population would grow and grow. And unlike the Arabs, the whites did not castrate their male slaves. And it's true that some of the slaves died off, and then they had to import, you know, con continuously get new ones. But on the whole, the slaves were treated well. They were fed reasonably well. They received medical attention if they needed it. So their future generations multiplied. In our public schools, we get drilled from the, a very young age into our heads that, you know, slavery was this terrible thing. The horror factor, the whippings, you know, the slave owner wh whipping, you know, all the scars on the back. And we get shown these photographs and and we don't really know the backstory. We don't know the context. And we're showing these to like eight-year-olds. What do you, Their brains aren't even fully developed. How can they even begin to understand history? It's very unwise. But that's, you know, that's the cultural Marxism. Just like I was mentioning racism. You see how these things get drilled into our head and then that affects, that's like a, a lens through which we view the world. We, we Even conservative people may have this cultural Marxist way of looking at the world drilled into them. So when it comes to these whippings, I mean, I'm sure you can find an example of sadists who did enjoy whipping their slaves. And that was bad, and that's another reason why slavery should not have existed. But was that a widespread phenomenon? We don't really know. Probably not. We don't know because there's no statistics. We only have anecdotes. Probably not, I say, because think of the context here. In many of these places, the blacks outnumbered the whites 20 to 1. Do you want to start, like assaulting the blacks and raping their women if they outnumber you 20 to 1. It should also make you skeptical of claims that the blacks were kept there by force. No, it was more of a feudal society. They, they like Kanye West says, it sounds like a choice to me.
and, he, and that was very controversial for him to say. There's a grain of truth in what he was saying, though. He's trying to wake up the blacks and say, you know, you don't have to be in that position. There were plenty of free blacks that could work their way up. Have you ever heard of a guy called Booker T. Washington? Read up on Booker T. Washington. He was a slave who was emancipated, but, you know, basically he embraced capitalism. He worked his way up. He did not d detest the white capitalists. He's, he's on the other side of the spectrum from W.E.B. Uh, Dubois, and then and who was writing around the turn of the 20th century. Basically, W.B. Dubois was like, we need more rights. Forget about progress and working hard and all that stuff. We need more rights now. You know, as I may have already mentioned, black slaves had a higher standard of living in America than they would have enjoyed back in Africa. Sure, it was difficult for the first generation. March to the slave coast. You know, you know, many of them died in the dungeons. Many more of them died on, on the terrible crossing. I'm not... Not saying that was a, a rosy thing, but once they got to the Americas, things would improve, especially for their, their children, if they had children. They could expect a higher standard of living. And then, of course, with time, the black population became so high that it began to displace the white population. And you wouldn't really see the full effects of that until some decades following the American Civil War of the 1860s. By the 1890s, there was a large uh, black migration from southern states to northern cities. They were not the free blacks that had already made inroads peacefully, organically to the north. No, this was a different migration. This was viewed as an invasion by the local whites. And the character of the blacks who came was very different from the free blacks, as you might imagine. Up to 10% of all the blacks in America on the eve of the Civil War were freed. They had achieved their freedom through hard work or through demonstration of intelligence. Sure, it may have you know, depended to some extent on good luck and on the benevolence of their former owners. Uh, I guess there were some ways for them to earn money, even though they were slaves and technically they weren't supposed to be getting money because you could purchase your freedom. Um, so there were different ways of getting freedom. And it's a fact that some of these freed blacks did own slaves themselves. On the eve of the American Civil War, there were two kinds of whites who were opposed to slavery. The first of these were the abolitionists. They were relatively wealthy and came from the northeastern states, as well as from Britain. The abolitionists are the forerunners of today's liberals. They didn't live next to the blacks, and they lacked direct experience of the black culture, although they may have known some free blacks. Yet, despite their ignorance, they were arrogant enough to try to create laws for all of the white states to live by. There was a similar condescension of the British Victorians towards the white uh, capitalists in Jamaica or in India. Now, of course, in India, that was not a population of Africans being ruled over. It was the, the, the local population of, of Indians. Um, but there was a similar situation going on where the, the, actually, you know, the British Empire improved the standard of living on the whole for India. And they created an educated class of administrators and bureaucrats. And then those same educated Indians demanded equal rights. It's the same civil rights story. We got Gandhi and we got all, you know, and eventually forced the British to, you know, the British had to give up India after World War II because they were broke. Um, but they, you know, it's the same similar dynamic. Ingratitude. The second group of whites who opposed slavery were the poor whites in the expanding Midwestern states. Those whites didn't care about helping the blacks like the abolitionists claim to want to do. For the settlers, they viewed the blacks as a threat and they had a long-standing dislike for the wealthy white landowners of the eastern seaboard and the feeling was mutual. And we know from anecdotes, we can't really say with certainty that there was division within the white society uh, in the sense that Irish immigrants were viewed as less v valuable, much less valuable than Negro slaves. And they would be subjected to even much greater danger of physical hardship or death. 
So, but the basic reason that the settlers in the Midwest wanted to limit slavery to the states it had already, you know, been established in was that the slave society is one where the African population becomes dominant in numbers and all the land gets bought up by the planter class because they have enough capital to purchase these large estates. You can't really make it with just a small amount of land. So if you don't have the money to do what the big planters are doing, you're basically out of luck as a poor white, a rel in, you know, relatively poor. So you'd, have, you'd be just forced to keep moving and they didn't want to keep moving forever. The mainstream narrative is that the Civil War was fought over slavery, but the truth will never be so clear as that, because less than 10% of Southern whites owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln did not issue his Emancipation Proclamation until January 1st, 1863, a good year and a half into this bloody, bloody conflict. In fact, Lincoln never envisioned a full integration of black and white society he was open to the possibility that they could go back to africa but of course that didn't end up happening lincoln's emancipation of the slaves was a botched process they fudged the job maybe they never really gave it any serious thought or planning it was something that happened during the course of the war as a political expediency to issue this proclamation. Remember that it was originally about maintaining the Union. There's a good economic argument that slavery would have died out on its own without the need for a war because slave society can't compete with industrial societies. There's no profit incentive, so the motivation of the slaves is very low and they're generally not educated. They lack sophisticated skills to operate in factories. But to be fair, I've heard, you know, the other argument, too, that it could have continued indefinitely. Who really knows? The slaves worked fewer hours than most of the poor free whites in America at the time. Their food was taken care of, their lodging. So all of that was thrown away in the blink of an eye, and they were left to fend for themselves. They had no land. They had very limited property. They had no real means of accumulating land. Some of them did return to Africa in places like Liberia, but it, there was relatively li limited numbers. I wonder why more of them didn't choose to go back to Africa. Could it have to do with the prosperity of America? Again, we just have anecdotes. I want to use an anecdote from this book. American Colossus, The Triumph of Capitalism, 1865 to 1900 by H.W. Brands. And uh, it's a big, thick book, over 500 pages. Not a very good book. I did read the whole thing. Uh, the, the problem with this book, I'll just be very short here because it's not really related to the main subject. It has culturally Marxist assumptions about race. Like he's using the word racist to talk about stuff which, you know, that word, as we know, didn't, wasn't created at that time. It wasn't in use. It's, you know, what we call racist is reflecting the normal way all peoples of the world, generally speaking, think and act. They discriminate, you know, this is, that, that needs a video of its own, and I will probably do that sometime in the future. I have done it in the past, but I'll do it again, you know. But basically, in, in a nutshell, I mean, we all discriminate. That's a natural thing. If you, can, if, if you can't discriminate, then, there's, then you lack ability. To, uh, like, if you can't see certain colors, you could, you, could uh, you know, be in trouble. If you can't tell the difference between a hornet and a fly, you could be in trouble. And then you want to say, well, it's unfair uh, discrimination. It's added, you're adding on that it's unfair. He pulled me over because I'm black. Or they called me whitey just because I'm white. And uh, they want to get stuff. They want to make me feel bad. It's like, well, I mean, you could call that racist, but is that really helpful? Because really, everyone in the world has these impulses. How we act on them is is different. That depends on context. That depends on many other things. We can rise above our impulses, but these impulses are also with us uh, to help us survive. So this book, my main complaint with it is. He has these culturally Marxist assumptions about race. He uses too many 
personal portraits. He likes to paint these characters and goes on and, and it's uh, it's nice to have a little a little bit of that, but it's too much. He uses the word democracy very loosely. Like democracy is you've got capitalism on one hand and democracy on the other and people throw around the word democracy just like racism now. Democracy is also a very tricky word because sometimes, well, it's the people. Well, what people are we talking about? It's the will of the people. Who? Oh, really? Is it the will of the people? What if, you know, what if 55% of the people think one way and 45% think another? Well, democracy, that's a great thing. Well, the founding fathers would not have necessarily agreed with that. Not all of them. Enough about me rambling on about the critique of this book. I just wanted to draw an anecdote which relates to the, the dissolution of the feudal society, as I'm calling it, of the slave state, or the slave states, in 1865. Some traveler from the north, he's going through the south and interviewing people, and one account, and, and the author points out that this was not a common thing, so I'm not using this anecdote to say that this is common, it, it's just one case. The former plantation owner, he's basically lost $150,000 in Negro slaves in the blink of an eye. He's not going to have a cotton crop. He's despairing. And he's telling the journalist or the writer, quote, uh, This man predicted that blacks would find their freedom a mixed blessing. And the man says, Some few Negroes go on and do well just as before, but they're might scarce. Others, especially the aged and the infirm, would long for the security of the old days when they could count on a roof over their heads and food on their tables. Already the reaction was setting in. Quote, a Negro drayman came to me the other day and asked me to buy him. He said, I want a master. When I had a master, I had nothing to do but eat and drink and sleep besides my work. Now I have to work and think, too. The former plantation owner says, well, the law will not allow him to buy back his former slave. And then the former slave looked very much discouraged. And what role would we be expecting these freed blacks, these emancipated blacks to fulfill in the expanding capitalist society of the late 19th century? Would they all be factory workers all of a sudden? Would they be blacksmiths? Would they be doing all, all of that stuff all of a sudden? Most of them? They lack the skills they lack the education, and unfortunately, they lack the IQ, because we know now, in our times, it's demonstrated that American blacks have an average IQ of 85, which is about 12, at least 12 points lower than the average white IQ. That's just an average. That's not saying everyone is like that, but it's, it, these averages are true. And sure, you could say IQ is, uh, you know, dependent on context, it's relative to some extent, but in terms of engineers, in terms of science, IQ is basically the same across cultures. That's why Korea or South Korea, Japan, you know, that's why they have a, a very highly technological capitalistic society today. East Asians have a slightly higher average IQ than whites. It's a few points higher, although whites have more geniuses. The botched manner in which emancipation unfolded led to the segregation era. Large numbers of poor, unhappy blacks roaming the land caused whites to be alarmed. And the black migration to city centers in Detroit, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and other cities caused white flight to the suburbs. Then we would get the angry rhetoric of Martin Luther King demanding more rights, more government assistance, affirmative action, and then later Obama continuing the same process. How could these black leaders make such demands on the whites? Well, there's two factors. Firstly, they do so by presenting a false narrative. A narrative which is completely opposed to reality and not what I'm presenting to you here. And secondly, they simply rode the wave of demographics. There are more blacks in the U.S. now than there have ever been before. Hasta luego, amigos!